Hi everyone, uh, this unit of work that you're about to begin is on wildfires and uh, what we're going to learn is what causes wildfires. Uh, in a future lesson we'll find out what the impacts of them are. You know you're going to be successful in this lesson if you if you know what the main causes are fires and you're able to describe how they happen so there'll be a, a writing task for you to do. As always in geography, uh, we focus on how the subject can help you have a career and uh, a job in the future. And it's useful to think about how we can get into jobs in land use management, perhaps in the Forestry Commission, National Parks, and of course the Fire, fire and other emergency services. Um, it's all relevant to you. So let's get started. First of all, what are the Australian wildfires? Now, um, I'm going to uh, play a short clip here, so I'll just get that going. Stuart, let's go to you now. You're at Sussex Inlet. You were there as the Carawan fire raged. What's the latest there on the ground? Greta, this fire is still very much out of control and it's now so large it reaches from the northern parts of Aradulla all the way up to the southern parts of Nowra. And today it burnt with such ferocity. We were at a roadblock uh, down on the Princess Highway when a spot fire from the Carawan blaze exploded next to us. We had to flee alongside police and residents in that area down to Sussex Inlet, where the one road in and out has now been closed. And it's been a very trying time for all RFS crews and residents here. Luckily, the spot fire was pushed away by the southerly, but it bought the Carawan fire front, which had those pyrocumulus clouds. And when it hit, it was terrifying. It was completely dark. There were embers flying overhead, and the wind was so strong. And the fire was so ferocious, you could hear trees exploding uh, in the forest. So it's been an incredibly difficult day, very treacherous and unpredictable conditions right up and down the coast. Also down in Batemans Bay, where we know that homes have been lost there. Uh, reporter Liv Casbin has more. After weeks of threatening coastal towns, the South Coast bushfires suddenly roared through the seaport, triggering warnings to residents from Cooma to Bega and north to Batemans Bay and beyond. Seems normal as fire approaches. As the blaze struck with ferocity, emergency crews were stretched thin, struggling in chaotic conditions. No! No! Strong, changeable winds fanning the destruction. No! In Batemans Bay, holiday makers Shops and cafes shut it up. It's horrific. It's like a war zone. Catastrophic. No words to describe it. Homes lost up the back of us. Scared, nervous. <laughs> um, kind of want to go home, but can't go home yet. So yeah, 
just planning on where to go from here. The firefighters battled these horrendous conditions. You could hear gas bottles exploding just a few kilometres from here. And people have come here to the water that makes them safer. Spot fires arrive under raging winds, with many residents choosing to stay and protect. We look like a jump the highway up at west of us. Then it's just roared down like a bloody freight train. If it gets too close, we're leaving. We're just staying in the house. Or if it doesn't, we're done to sit outside trying to help the fire eaters. At Lake Condola, locals watch as dozens of homes and businesses burn down. At Mogo Zoo, a superhuman effort to move animals and protect structures is underway. We got out and we watered everything we possibly could. Any species of animal that was small enough uh, or in an area that we couldn't protect, we caught up. Staff grateful that rare creatures were saved. <coughs> a moment of defiance against a fire that seemed unstoppable. In Tasman, ABC News, Kate McDonald. Now to Hamish McDonald, who spent the day at the evacuation centre in Bega. Hamish, thousands of visitors have had to flee holiday homes along the coast. What's the mood like there? Uh, Karina, I should let you know that just as we go to air tonight in the eastern states, we're feeling a few drops of rain falling uh, here at the Bega showground. Not a lot, not enough probably to get excited about, but significant nonetheless. Uh, today has been absolutely extraordinary. I've covered plenty of bushfires in my reporting career, I have never experienced anything like this. You need to be here to understand what it is like being in communities that are entirely cut off. To the south, there were bushfires. To the west, there were bushfires. To the north, there were bushfires. And in every direction, roads were cut off. And that's what saw so many hundreds, indeed thousands of people, take refuge wherever they could. With fire coming at them from the north, the south and west, there was only one direction. Residents and holidaymakers fled. Along the south coast, hundreds fled to the water any way they could. It's the unprecedented um, things we're seeing at the moment, particularly with all our surf clubs on the far south coast, where we have you know, approximately you know, six to 7,000 people sheltering at Vermicure alone, over 4,500 people there. Overnight, a time-lapse video captured the moment hell enveloped the town of Grover. It was just like looking into the like the gates of hell, it was just incredible. It was so intense in the more than one section. I was like, and that's when I realised that we'd done the right thing to grab him. Caroline Long and her dogs got out of their home in nearby Verona at 1am. It's a weatherboard house on top of a ridge next to a mountain. Yeah, I don't think there's anything left. Daniel Marshall spent today fighting to save a mate's house just a day after his family lost their own home. The most intense thing that I've ever experienced. That's insane. They're gone. Everyone's alive. Paul Carroll lost all but his car. This is it. This is my five kids, my missus and me. This is, it's all we own. I have lost our whole house, but I didn't get my nanny's rings out, my wedding rings. I'm really sad about that. Can you actually cope with this, with the scale? I don't know. I don't know. The bigger showground is one of many evacuation points for families now locked in by road closures. Anna Van Gorda and Rachel Lamont left their home in Tanger but couldn't convince their father and cousin to leave. I just said I can't, I, I can't say goodbye, I can't say goodbye. It's not the end. I don't want to say goodbye. They've been arriving here all afternoon in their hundreds, maybe even thousands, with their families, their trailers, their caravans, some even with their boats. If they are celebrating tonight here at the Vegas Showgrounds, and it's felt like night all day, it'll simply be that they made it out safely. Hamish McDonald, ABC News. Okay, so that's a bit of an introduction to what wildfires are, and you, you'll have taken on board a lot from that, I hope. Um, the wildfires that affected Australia um, affected vast areas of Australia, but uh, we're going to focus on uh, Victoria and New South Wales in the southeastern quarter of Australia. Um, and you can see from this map the huge areas that have been destroyed. 
a wildfire is basically a fire that spreads um, through uh, dried out woodland, grassland or bush scrub. And it's uh, once started, it's an almost impossible force to stop. To give you an idea of scale, because the map I've just shown you here is difficult for you to get an idea of the size of the area that has been destroyed. Uh, this gives you it in comparative area to if it was the same area of England and Wales. And that gives you a real sense for the number of communities, people and uh, livelihoods that are, of course, going on in these areas that have been burned out and the danger that that presents to, uh, to life. As you can see, an estimated 10 million hectares was destroyed, but that's difficult to imagine. These maps help you do that. So what's it like being uh, in a wildfire? Well, this graphic, I think, uh, summarizes it uh, in a simple way. Uh, you can see your average running uh, person's running speed um, and the speeds at which a forest or grass fire move. And um, concerningly, both the forest and the grass fire move faster than the average person. And of course, these speeds here do not take into account the effect of the wind. Uh, the wind can speed up the movement of, a, of either type of fire and um, the fire will advance at the speed of the wind speed, uh, whatever that happens to be at the time. So wildfires are clearly really dangerous things, but what we need to understand is how they happen. In the next lesson, we'll deal with what the impacts are, but today we're going to deal with how they happen, what their causes are. So the first thing we need to start off with is the Indian Ocean Dipole, uh, something you've probably not heard of before. Here's Australia, India and Africa, and in between we have the Indian Ocean. The Indian Ocean is cooler on one side and warmer on the other, and that creates a circulation of water in the Indian Ocean known as an ocean current. Some people might even call it an ocean gyre, G-Y-R-E, but that's quite a technical term. Where the water is warmer, it evaporates and creates clouds and rain. Where the water is cooler, it evaporates less and therefore does not create as many clouds and rain. And for that reason, the east of Africa tends to be wetter than the west of Australia. Um, when this process happens uh, in a more extreme way, that can really cause drought in Australia and extreme flooding in East Africa. And indeed, at the time of the Australian wildfires, uh, less news coverage was given to the massive flooding that uh, displaced um, millions of people in East Africa. So uh, where there is drought here and uh, that means that there's often flooding over here. And this is called the Indian Ocean Dipole. If you're taking notes, you should take the notes in orange. This graphic here um, uh, this graphic here uh, it, I'm just going to try and make play, but I, I'm struggling to do that. Um, bear with me. Uh, so uh, I'm going to skip over that graphic. You'd have it in your live, your class, your lesson in class. But it shows you the circulation of the ocean currents in the Indian Ocean. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not able to make it play right now. Um, now, uh, the next big factor that caused the Australian wildfires is the average temperature in Australia. The average temperatures in Australia have seen record highs. And you can see here these very dark red areas where temperatures peaked over 45 degrees as an average. That doesn't mean that they, they managed to reach that peak just once and it was a special moment. That means the average normal temperature um, at, in the middle of the Australian summer uh, was 45 degrees, incredibly warm in other words. And of course that meant that the forests and grasslands were super dry. So how does climate change affect things? Well, um, 
in this graph, you can see how the average temperatures um, have been um, have been below or above average level. And you can see that with increasing frequency, Australian temperatures have been above average. You can see the years rolling by along the bottom of the graph. And um, in class, we would do some work to interpret this graph. Uh, when you do your um, homework based on this, you might look at this graph to get some good facts and figures. 2019 was the hottest on record, and that's a big cause of the Australian wildfires. It's also really concerning for the future because, of course, this trend, that means pattern, is rising. The next cause of the fire is actually something to do with the fires themselves. Um, you can see in this map how the fires are actually happening in different two different locations. And though at this scale, it's, uh, it's difficult to see detail, but where these um, areas of potential fire spread are, la are labelled, you can also see areas of potential ember attack. And what's happening here is that this, for example, this area of current burnt area is being affected by the wind direction, which is blowing embers, that's glowing bits of, of tree and plant through the air, and they are then being blown into new, as yet, unburnt areas. And that makes the, the fires incredibly difficult to stop, because you're not just fighting one fire, that fire itself is spreading small um, pop-up fires uh, um, ahead of itself. And uh, the fire services actually divert, divert quite a lot of resources to trying to stop those fires that are starting up, rather than tackling the fire that is already very established. The next major cause, and remember the, the notes are in orange and that's what you should have a record of, um, are pyrocumulus clouds. Um, pyrocumulus clouds are very large clouds. A cumulus cloud is a big cloud, a big fluffy cloud like the one that you see here. Um, and uh, cumulonimbus clouds are ones that create lightning storms. Well, pyrocumulus clouds are similar. Uh, they're very, very large, and that creates a lot of um, pressure movement in the air. And uh, they create their own rainstorms. Now, you might think that that's a good thing, because if the fire is here, and the all that rising moisture from the fire as the plants are burned creates this massive cloud and causes a downburst of rain. And that would be good, but because of the rapid formation of these clouds, they also create lightning due to all of the friction. And this lightning can then spark a new fire ahead of the main one. And again, that makes it very difficult for the emergency services to tackle these fires and, and, and deal with them as they're happening. Forest management is really important to stopping fires, and the Australian authorities are very good at their forest management, but there were areas where the forest management had not been carried out so effectively. Here you can see a fire break. That's an area where the trees have been deliberately cleared, so if the ones on the right are burning, there is a physical gap between those that are burning and the next part of the forest. And that aims to slow down the, uh, the advance of the fire, and it also gives access routes for emergency services to tackle that front line of the burning. But where this isn't happening, the fire will just rage unstop uh, 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 unstopped. Another cause of the fire is a man-made one, I'm afraid, and that is through littering. Somebody drops a lit cigarette end, and of course that can start a fire, but most people are pretty conscientious about not doing that uh, because they know the kind of scale of disaster that it can lead to. But something that maybe people are less aware of is the damage that littered glass can do. Um, a piece of glass can focus the sun's rays to the point where it starts a fire. And uh, this is a really, really difficult challenge to try and tackle and stop. Of course, climate change, I've already mentioned, is, ra is raising the average temperatures in Australia and globally, but uh, it is nonetheless worth knowing that climate change itself is causing widespread wildfires to occur around the world. Countries in the same year as the Australian wildfires that were affected and the year after uh, are Brazil with the Amazon wildfires, uh, the Californian wildfires were absolutely massive, 
and wildfires in Scotland. Up in the Highlands, uh, there were large-scale wildfires. And that's just a few examples. If you do your own research, you'll find that this is a global problem. Irresponsible campfires are another example of how people uh, can, just through their own uh, ignorance and negligence, uh, cause fires to start. Okay. We're nearly there, guys. Um, the wind is an important factor. If you imagine trying to start a fire for yourself, it's common that you might blow on it to get air into the, to introduce oxygen, to try and make the, the flames burn better. Well, windy conditions uh, combined with a wildfire are a deadly combination. Not only does the wind fuel the fire, but it causes it to move more quickly. So the windier the conditions are, the more dangerous a wildfire can be. So those are all the um, factors that cause wildfires. A task that we'll do in class, uh, so if you're watching this because you weren't in class, this is the task that we would do, be doing, is to sort them into human and physical factors. So going back to the notes we've just taken, um, you want to sort the words in bold into a table with those two headings. If you pause the video now, you can attempt that activity. And here are the answers. So you can see that the causes divide into physical, natural processes and human-led processes. So this is very much a combination of nature and human activity causing these fires to spread. Here's the task that you need to do. I'll let you read the instructions for yourself, but I will go through the gold standard instructions. If you want to really challenge yourself, and you should always want to do that, push for gold. Um, you want to use full, detailed sentences to describe six factors that cause wildfires. There must be a mixture of physical and human factors, otherwise you can't get six marks. And you should support it with at least one diagram. And if you're not sure what diagram to use, then you should reconsult this video or um, the lesson notes that you have because the pyrocumulus cloud diagram would be an excellent one to include. Or alternatively, you could do one for the ocean dipole in the Indian Ocean. You need six factors. Uh, they must be a mixture of physical and human, uh, though it doesn't have to be a 50-50 split, and you should support it with one diagram. If you're less ambitious, you can try silver or bronze, and you'll find that there's a help sheet to help you write the paragraph um, available just next to this video on the website. Something to think about now that we're at the end of the lesson is what's the name of the movement of heat in the Indian Ocean that causes the drought in Australia? It's a really important process. Um, and it's in the Indian Ocean. So that's a key question I might ask you when you're back in class. And what is the name of the cloud that causes wildfires to keep spreading? There are two really technical names and geography is full of technical processes. So those are two questions that I might ask you when you come back to class um, if you've missed the lesson. Okay, that's the end of the lesson, guys. And um, I hope you found that informative. Uh, make sure that you've taken your notes nice and neatly. Make sure that you attempt the task um, using these instructions, reading them carefully before you do. And remember, if you need help, there is a, a worksheet that you can uh, download just next to this video, which will um, like uh, help you write out the answer with a bit of, uh, bit of assistance. Okay.